1987, Alan Moore was probably the closest thing to a safe bet for DC Comics. The man had reinvented Swamp Thing to great critical success, introduced the wildly popular John Constantine, and wrote for The Man Who Has Everything and Whatever Happened to the Man of Tomorrow, two critical hits about Superman. He wrote Watchmen, one of the most successful graphic novels of all time, still heralded as one of, if not the best, and the only comic to ever win a Hugo Award. Even if we may not be his biggest fan, we have to admit, the numbers and the critics were there. Alan Moore could seemingly do no wrong in the eyes of his following. Presumably, when you have a sure thing in your employ, and they say that they can make you money, you would take them up on the offer, right? Well, in 1987, Alan Moore proposed a comic book event called Twilight of the Superheroes. Moore envisioned a story that could provide an end to the DC Universe, cementing the characters as legends. The story would be a frame narrative surrounding John Constantine finding about the exploits of his future self that operated in a post-apocalyptic world, in which governments were dissolved, replaced by a feudal system, with various heroes playing the role of Lord of the House. The story would be hinted to be an unavoidable future, and while Moore didn't suggest that DC stop publishing these stories, he posed Twilight of the Superheroes as the canon ending to the then-singular DC Universe. Now, he also argued for reinstating the multiverse, which had recently been condensed to one Earth following Crisis on Infinite Earths. And the story would also not be cemented as either explicitly canon or non-canon, instead being a hinted possible future that might happen, similarly to the recent release of Future's End, which, of course, never came and will never come to fruition in the mainstream DC universe. Now, this was back before it became apparent that DC was going to own Watchmen for the foreseeable future, as they could just keep reprinting the novel and thus retain the rights. It's hard to say if this project would have kept more in good favor with the company, but he at least seemed both excited and certain that it would make money. So, why have you never even seen Twilight of the Superheroes? Well, it probably has something to do with the story being really bad. Twilight of the Superheroes was never produced, and it's pretty obvious why when you read the proposal. But it's more than just a proposal for an unproduced comic. It's emblematic of the mindset behind mainstream comics in the late 80s and early 90s. It's a clear example of how modern comics often operate, as it allows us to see the thought process behind decisions that would, on paper, be ridiculous. By examining the early draft for a bad story written by a talented writer, we can understand how comics changed after Watchmen, how the creative individual saw superheroes, and how we can both create and consume media in a more discerning matter. Chapter 1. Am I Here All Alone? Before I can truly critique this work in a way that would be beneficial to an audience that hasn't read it, I need to summarize it. The framing device involves John Constantine being warned of a horrible future by Rip Hunter, who has just escaped a flux in the time continuum created by Wonder Woman and Legion of Superheroes villain the Time Trapper. In this time, heroes have become tyrants, and the future John Constantine sent Hunter to enlist John in preventing this apocalypse from ever occurring. The main story is about this apocalyptic world. Following the collapse of the U.S. government, different superheroes became feudal lords. Though this world is not a nuclear wasteland, it is no less dystopic. Save Superman, all aliens have been killed or driven off the planet, and superpowered protectors have become overlords. Superman leads the House of Steel alongside Wonder Woman, whom he has married, and she has since changed her name to Superwoman. They operate out of a new fortress of solitude, alongside their petulant son and kind daughter. The two love each other and struggle with the idea that they want to help people, but are ultimately the only source of structure and must uphold their regime. The other most powerful house is the House of Thunder, led by an increasingly aloof Captain Marvel. He is married to Mary Marvel, yes, his sister, and it's horrible, and I'll get to it. However, Mary Marvel is having an affair with Captain Marvel Jr. The two Batsons have a daughter that is betrothed to the new Superboy, poised to unite the most powerful governments left. House of Thunder is on the West Coast, and is home to characters from Fawcett comics like Talky Tawny and Mr. Mind. Other houses have less power. The House of Titans is owned by an embittered Nightwing, grieving the loss of Starfire. Joining him are an unstoppable Rage Machine and Hawk, 
who lost Dove, a cyborg that is becoming less and less human, a beast boy that is retreating into abstract animality and becomes the chimera, and a raven that seems to be doing pretty well for herself. The House of Justice is what remains of the Justice League. Veterans like Captain Atom, Blue Beetle, and Dr. Light are still around, while Titans alumni Aqualad, Wonder Girl, and Kid Flash have all become Aquaman, Wonder Woman, and The Flash, respectively. Also, there is a female speedster that was being proposed at the time that never came to be. There's the House of Secrets for supervillains, Luther, Joker, Grodd, Cold, Catwoman, and Savannah, rule over Nevada, and actually protect their constituents, thus avoiding, at least temporarily, the justice of the heroic houses. The exiled aliens, be it lantern wielders, Martians, Thanagarians, or otherwise, have settled on one of Mars's moons, and are still hoping to return to Earth at an opportune moment. They rely on Adam Strange, their only contact on Earth, and go by the name the House of the Lanterns. And there's also a house for magic and a house for time travelers, but they don't seem to impact the story. There's also Gotham City, not under the control of any one house. Here at Sandy's Place, a bar owned by the retired Phantom Lady, there's a bunch of little character vignettes, not unlike the newsstand in Watchmen. A drunk jingoistic Uncle Sam, a paramilitary leader Blackhawk, a prostitute plastic man, and even a doll man that spent so much time in his short form that he became a spindly insect man incapable of human communication. So gritty and realistic. Throughout Gotham, we have a robot man that acts as a liaison between the House of Justice and Titans. He's close to the Metal Men. Only four of them have survived the apocalypse, with gold staying in hiding, lead becoming irradiated, iron becoming a construction worker, and platinum becoming a waitress at a sex bar. And yes, she's the only woman in the group, and it's horrible, and I'll get to it. There's also a Kong gorilla that acts as a mob boss and abuses the gorilla brain that's trapped in his old human body, an old homeless Metron, Green Arrow and Black Canary running their own newspaper, and finally there's Question, who is investigating the death of a short individual who was in a locked room with a sex worker and was found alone in bondage with his neck broken in one clean blow. Lastly, you didn't think a gritty DC crossover event would be complete without Batman, did you? Batman's been recruiting Pulp Fiction heroes. Here, Moore seems to believe that the spirit is in the public domain. He's not. He also believes that Tarzan and Doc Savage probably are too. And they're, uh, they're not. They weren't, and they're not. Like I said, Mary Marvel Jr. and Superboy are to be wed, even though they don't like each other, which means the two biggest empires are about to unite. Nobody else wants that, least of all Nightwing, who is able to unite the Justice League and the Injustice Society. The main player in the story, however, is John Constantine, who does his best to manipulate everybody. He gets information from different sources, be it Green Arrow and Black Canary, or Question, and he convinces the three allied houses to attack the site of the wedding ceremony. He also convinces Captain Marvel to do nothing when the attack falls, and he agrees. He is also searching for Metron and Gold, he also plans Adam Strange's final Zeta Beam to return all of the aliens to Earth. He also solves the locked room mystery. He also urges Batman's group to attack. Get it? He's smart. Then the day comes where Captain Marvel does nothing, and Wonder Woman is killed by Superwoman, who is killed by Captain Adam. Superboy dies, Mary Marvel Sr., Captain Marvel Jr., and Supergirl flee into space. Almost all of the superheroes die. But Superman survives the initial attack and drives back the opponents. But then the Zeta Beam comes down, and all of the Hawks and the Lanterns attack. Superman thinks he's safe with Captain Marvel at his back, but it turns out that Captain Marvel is actually Martian Manhunter. See, the diminutive corpse that was found in the locked room was actually Billy Batson in human form, murdered by Martian Manhunter disguised as a sex worker. Yeah. This Billy Batson is in the body of a child, and it's unbelievably horrible, and I will get to it. Superman disposes of Martian Manhunter, but is killed by the Green Lanterns. Then Batman's team shows up, wearing gold skin on their bodies, and beat back the Green Lanterns. Then the rest of the aliens get called away by the fact that John Constantine used Metron's Mobius chair to send Quardians to their home planets. Thus... Batman becomes the guide of humanity, 
which Moore says we'll see an anarchist utopia now that superpowers have been banished from the Earth. Young John Constantine, wishing to stop this future, tries to warn his friends, but is repeatedly unsuccessful, as older Constantine wants him to be. Old John wants to steal this fate for the woman he loves. Young John finds this out and then meets a woman that he falls in love with at first sight, but refuses to give her a light, thus preventing the future while avoiding finding his soulmate. Or does he? Chapter 2. The Darkness of Insanity There is a lot of things wrong with this story, but I'd first like to get into why so many awful choices were made, and I think it really comes down to the success of Watchmen. Watchmen was fantastic, so much so that it changed how comic books were both made and read forever. YouTuber H Bomber Guy released a video in 2016 analyzing how the works of Moore and some other popular artists in his time ruined comics, as creators in the 90s copied the idea of gritty and dark characters, but didn't recreate the nuance or detail that the artist put into the story. It seems, in some ways, Moore himself took the same direction. Everyone loved Watchmen, and it comes through in his proposal that Moore knew this. He writes like he's writing Watchmen, but the characters aren't his, and they are thus not developed enough to make them interesting, and they don't even have reason to be as awful as they are. With Watchmen, we get explanations as to why these characters are willing to kill. We get their backstories, we get their internal monologues, we get their sins and fears. But these characters aren't Moore's creations, which means we get inexplicable character decisions, like the idea that Wonder Woman would ever kill Donna Troy, or that Kong Gorilla would torture an innocent animal. Watchmen wasn't good because it was realistic or because it deconstructed heroes, like a lot of its imitators seem to have thought it was. But it also wasn't good because it contained sexual assault and senseless murder, like Moore seems to have briefly thought. Moore followed up Watchmen with the killing joke, and the book contains the abuse and objectification of Barbara Gordon to manipulate and motivate men. It has the brutality of Watchmen, but it revels in this darkness with Barbara being a minor character in her own abuse. Similar things happen in Twilight of the Superheroes. Dark things befall the heroes that readers love, but this is a story about John Constantine. Wonder Woman gives up her identity for her husband and murders her sister. But the real hero is John Constantine. Mary Marvel commits incest and adultery. Doll Man becomes a spindly insect man that is owned by the Phantom Lady. Almost every single character that you love is a murderer. But the story revolves around John Constantine. When dark events happen in Watchmen, they happen to major characters. We don't get to see Mothman abused at a mental asylum. But by sheer volume of cast, we have horrible things happening to characters that people recognize, and most of them are unpleasant. This problem shows up in modern crossover events, especially if they take place in an alternate reality or in a possible future. There's a limited number of main characters, and thus we see horrific results for characters we love used only as shock value, such as seeing Black Canary's face sewn into Frankenstein's body, or Wasp being eaten by the blob. The culmination of this prioritization of shock over taste is when Moore suggests that an unaged Billy Batson was murdered while in bondage with a sex worker. Moore spends part of the proposal talking about the marketability of this series, and he even references the fact that eight-year-olds pick up comics, and he still did not see anything wrong about proposing a major plot point in the main event for a company that markets to children involves the body of a minor found murdered in bondage. In Moore's defense, he has admitted that he is not fond of the brutality that he wrote for The Killing Joke, and I bet if he had written Twilight of the Superheroes that he would be ashamed of the perverted images he had requested be drawn. But that cultural idea of dark equals good made a great writer think, even if temporarily, that the most despicable imagery possible would be acceptable. Watchmen wasn't good because it was dark and contained the death of a child. It was good because it was well-written, well-drawn, and well-colored, it set up a complex world and used symbolism and foreshadowing amazingly. When we admire a work, we want to make our creative works resemble it. But neither by copying design, like Liefeld, or by copying tone, like more in the late 80s, will we recapture what made a work good. Chapter 3. Set a Mark Upon There's also a gap in this storytelling. 
We're told that roughly 20 years have passed, and Superman is fine with killing and tyranny, and Batman will wear a sentient being's corpse as armor, and Wonder Woman will recreate herself to match her husband. Writing within established continuity permits different freedoms and constraints than creating a world of your own. You're free to neglect many aspects of world building and character development, as those have been established by previous creators. On the other hand, you can't just make characters do whatever you want without it seeming forced. You have to explain why a character would go against their years of history and behave differently. Good art in established worlds allow us to see how our favorite characters deal with new situations, and how they would slowly change to meet new realities. Bad art in established world forgoes this to reach the point where their story is being told. I've seen it argued that a superhero acting out of character isn't a big deal, as long as the story is good, and maybe that's true, but unless we get a reason that the character acts the way they do, we're being cheated out of half of a story. In Zack Snyder's Man of Steel, Superman behaves differently than the one we know from the comics, but we see why this is. We get his backstory and motivations. Whether we like it is different, but it is explained. However, in Snyder and Joss Whedon's Justice League, we have about as small an amount of effort as possible to explain why Aquaman is the way he is. We recognize his trident, his abilities, and his name, but this isn't the Aquaman that we know and love. It's neither the over-the-top, ridiculously lovable Silver Age Aquaman or the brooding, patriotic, modern age Aquaman. This is a grumpy frat boy, and we don't get an explanation why. Twilight of the Superheroes is this times a thousand. Brand recognition allows readers to say, oh, that's an S on his chest. That means it's Superman. I love Superman. He's so kind and serves as a symbol of how we can help one another despite our differences and use our privileges to empower others. And thus we are then disappointed when the Superman is acting like Nero for no explained reason. We're told that Superman acts as a tyrant because he's the only form of stability, but that's not how Superman behaves. Clark Kent is an investigative reporter. He exposes abuses of power, and he never uses his powers beyond a reason of protection. He has no desire for control or to be obeyed. The moment you tell us a tyrant, it stops being Superman and stops being a tyrant that just resembles Superman. A story where Superman in the mainstream universe is a fascist is unbelievable. It's as unbelievable as saying that he's actually three porcupines stacked on top of each other. Twilight of the Superheroes relies on the audience to recognize these characters, but ignore that they aren't the same. I don't mean to keep referencing Watchmen, but it applies here. The story was originally going to feature famous DC characters like Blue Beetle and The Question instead of Night Owl and Rorschach. This was disliked by DC, and an original world was thus created. As it was built from the ground up, nothing was out of place in the story that Moore wanted to tell. With Twilight of the Superheroes, the symbols on the superheroes are the only things left recognizable, and we would have had to suspend all disbelief to think this was how our favorite characters could wind up. Twilight of the Superheroes would have been a bad story if it was in an original universe, but it would have been a better one. Chapter 4, The Least Detachment. Let's talk about Moore's ending. Not the ending of the framing narrative, but of the main story. Batman and his non-public domain friends have killed the overlords, or started wars to drive them off, leaving behind a world in shambles, but one without government, where people are free to be their own rulers and decide what they want to do with their lives. Alan Moore is openly an anarchist, and he's quite proud of that fact, and I respect that. The anarchy he describes believing to be best for the world sounds lovely. He wants at most an administration and freedom for people to live and let live. The downside to that is that it doesn't come without intervention. This is not me condemning revolution, nor is it me condemning anarchy. This is me saying that the political message that is contained in Twilight of the Superheroes is confused. Anarchy, in Moore's story, is achieved by manipulating literal superpowers into killing each other. John Constantine even starts wars in foreign locations to distract his enemies, and this somehow creates a utopia. Look, I'm not saying that Moore thinks that we should kill all government employees, 
or start wars to distract them. This is obviously a fictional story, not his to-do list, but I think it's interesting that the world he wants to see only comes about in his writing as a result of threatened genocide. Ayn Rand, in Atlas Shrugged, proposes objectivism, but posits it as being possible only as a result of a perpetual energy machine. Alan Moore, in Twilight of the Superheroes, proposes that anarchy is the best and ultimately good way of governing oneself, but posits it as only being possible as a result of beaming your oppressors into space. Batman is the idea of a fascist overthrowing fascists and then immediately giving all power to the people. I don't want to make a major point of this, but little is offered within the text of this story, or indeed most stories about anarchy, that suggest it is either possible or peaceful. Alan Moore has said in an interview with Margaret Kiljoy that he doesn't believe that violent revolution would result in anarchy, and I respect that again. But Moore's work has, in the past, venerated Guy Fox, a religious terrorist, and inspired movements with good intentions that will tolerate anti-Semitism. Chapter 5. The Pensive Muse no discussion of a work by Alan Moore would be complete without mentioning sex and gender. One of the most common criticisms of Alan Moore is that he has a fixation on displaying sexual assault. He has defended his right to do this, but as feminist comics critic Kelly Kaneyama says, nobody is alleging that Moore cannot write about sexual violence, but that he is doing so in an inappropriate manner. I assert that depicting the body of a minor in a sexual context, even if the mind is that of an adult, is inappropriate. But this is a problem beyond more. Artists all over the world will look to find loopholes to depict minors in sexual situations. They'll cast adults to play high schoolers but show scenes where they have sex. They'll age up characters through magic or otherwise and pair them with an adult, sexualizing the minds of underage individuals. Or, like more, they'll say that a character has the body of a child but the mind of an adult, thus instead sexualizing the bodies of underage individuals. This horrible idea for a story is predatory enough that I would reckon it is the main reason DC canned the script. But Moore still has a bit of a problem with how he portrays women, at least in the 80s. I've seen it argued that all of the women in Watchmen are defined by their relationship with a man. While this isn't technically true because of Joey and her girlfriend, it's close. Twilight of the Superheroes is close to that point of representation. Mary Marvel Sr. is delegated to the role of Queen of the House of Thunder, and is mentioned in the proposal as either cheating on her husband or running away with her boyfriend. Mary Marvel Jr. is to be forced into an arranged marriage against her will, and we don't even learn what happens to her at the end of the story, where everyone else is killed. Raven becomes the den mother for the Titans. Starfire is killed to motivate Nightwing. Platinum is implied to be a sex worker and Black Canary has become Green Arrow's housewife. Sandy Knight, the retired phantom lady, fares a little bit better, but we're still told that despite her age, she still got, quote, sexuality to her, end quote. Interestingly, we aren't told how sexy Uncle Sam is. But Sandy is still the closest thing to an independent female character in this proposal, and she still serves no purpose in the plot beyond owning a bar where the men can meet to talk. Worst of all, though, is Wonder Woman. Oh, sorry, Superwoman. A lot of people ship Wonder Woman with Superman. I don't, but you know, it's not inherently a bad couple. In regular universes, they're both nice, caring, and strong individuals who want to help others. But the pairing here just feels mean-spirited. Wonder Woman removes her identity to conform to a man's. She doesn't even serve a point in the story beyond being Superman's enforcer. But this is something a lot of male writers tend to do. In Infinite Crisis, Jeff Johns writes Wonder Woman as a confused loner with no direction or purpose. In All-Star Batman and Robin, and in The Dark Knight Strikes Again, Frank Miller writes Wonder Woman as a straw feminist that just needs a man that's strong enough to put her in her place. In Injustice Gods Among Us, Tom Taylor writes Wonder Woman as a warmonger that thinks humans are too stupid to look after themselves. Wonder Woman is intimidating for a lot of male authors. She's as independent as Batman, but as loving as Superman. So rather than see this as a way to write a role model for young girls, showing that you can be simultaneously strong and kind, 
she is pushed too far in one direction. She either becomes an alien too naive to understand the world, or a killing machine too violent to empathize with it. Moore's work on Rob Liefeld's character Glory, a pastiche of Wonder Woman, goes the route of struggling to understand humanity. The Twilight of the Superheroes version goes the violent route. And other heroines go in similarly stereotypical roles, despite their supposed equal status. Did you notice how Sandra Knight is surrounded by her former colleagues that are leading teams, or enterprising, or solving murders, and she's just their emotional support system? Phantom Lady was created to be a scintillating image for the consumption of heterosexual men, yes, but she became a proactive anti-Nazi warrior that could outclass assassins. Question gets the Rorschach treatment. Phantom Lady gets the B. Arthur in the Star Wars Holiday Special treatment. Black Canary has less to do than her husband. Platinum is relegated to being Robot Man's girlfriend. Starfire gets fridged 12 years before Alexandra DeWitt. Raven loses all of her characterization to become the stabilizer for her male counterparts. Mary Marvel Jr. is deemed unimportant enough to ignore. Mary Marvel Sr. is as far from her original character as Superman is. Moore has created some decent representations of women. Sure, oftentimes rape is used to motivate them or objectify them, but there are characters that manage to be decent. But maybe, especially if Moore himself has expressed some distaste for the extent of his work into darkness in the past, we don't need to imitate everything that the man did, and in some cases continues to do. I realize I didn't mention Supergirl. In this, Superman and Wonder Woman are trying to get her to marry Captain Marvel Jr. Now, as this would take place 13 to 20 years into the future of the DCU, Captain Marvel Jr. would be, at minimum, late 20s, and Supergirl would be, at maximum, 17. Moore's not the only author to pair up older teenagers with adults. This is so often portrayed as commonplace that it could be a video of itself. It should be a video of itself. Whatever. But Moore, even though he never commends or condones sexual assault, makes classic characters complicit in it. It's almost like he hates these characters. Well, about that. Chapter 6. The Rainbow and the Stairway Breaking news as we come on! A new segment has been found in our ongoing series of Gentiles Don't Understand Fiction Made by Jewish People. Latest to throw his hat into the ring. Comic book creator Alan Moore, famous for making deconstructions of superheroes, alleges that superhero comics are made for 12-year-old boys of 50 years ago, stunt the emotional growth of their consumers, and asserts that, quote, The superheroes of my youth had dogs that dressed in capes and masks. It's obvious they stand for nothing other than the power of the imagination. I tend to see a lot of these current figures as the focus of a kind of unhealthy escapism. It's easy to be cynical. It's hard to be optimistic. But it's nearly impossible to be curious. If you see Superman and you're like Alan Moore, you might have one of two reactions. You might think that it's great fun, as it allows children to make believe, or you might think that it's a destructive power fantasy. But Superman wasn't created for people like Alan Moore. Sure, he was created to be enjoyed by all people, but that's not what he was created to be. Nor is that whom he was created by. Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster were two Jewish men born to European immigrants fleeing anti-Semitism. Both families changed their names to blend in. The Schusters lived in poverty, with an eight-year-old Joe picking up jobs to support his family. Shortly before creating Superman, Jerry's father was assaulted by a shoplifter and died of a resulting heart attack. These men faced hatred and uneven playing fields based not on their choices, not on their actions, but on who they were born as. How was Superman first introduced? Yeah, we know the similes and the capabilities, but the first sentence that includes his name describes him as Superman, Champion of the Oppressed. Superman wasn't created as a brooding god with too much power to know what to do with. He wasn't created as an unhealthy power fantasy for already privileged men to see themselves in. Superman was created as an example of what we should all try to be, helping those less fortunate with what makes us more so. 
In his first appearance, Clark saves a man wrongly convicted of murder and stops a man abusing his wife. He's not here for power. He's here for hope. I'm not saying that Moore couldn't understand that. He was poor in his childhood and has mentioned that he faced abuse growing up. No, I'm saying that he didn't understand that. Superheroes aren't just showing the power of the imagination. They're allegory for social activism. They're proponents of progressive change. And they're illustrations of the good that we can be. It's not a coincidence that superhero comics were largely started by Jewish Americans or immigrants. When society works in your favor, a benevolent being with amazing powers seems like silly escapism. But you've already got that in your real life. For the oppressed, however, for whom superheroes are champions, and for sympathetic readers, it's an example of how to use power correctly. But thus we get people who aren't oppressed doing deconstructions that ultimately read like paranoia of change. If Wonder Woman was ever in charge, she'd murder and abuse men and women without reason, since that's what men do. If Mr. Terrific was ever really successful, he'd be a sellout, since that's what white entrepreneurs do. And if Superman was ever relied on to lead, he'd be a manipulative, warmongering politician, because that's what natural-born citizens do. You don't have to like Superman, but maybe he's not as much of a power fantasy as you think he is. Chapter 7. A Piece of Money Ha <laughs> ha! You thought we were done? Look at the timer, fool! We haven't even touched upon how this is all capitalism. Okay, easy, fault. Thomas. Blow them yes, away! I want to talk about the real motivation for all of this. More shows, be it in better works or in real life, empathy and compassion, which seems missing in this proposal. That's because what's being proposed isn't just a work of art. It's a selling point. Moore is excited about merchandising opportunities for Twilight of the Superheroes, and even anticipates success in selling t-shirts, posters, role-playing games, and one day even a movie, which he seems to now hate so much. I don't think Moore wants these memorabilia to collect out of any appreciation for them. I think it's because he wants the money. Man, wouldn't you love a doll man insect figure? Or, at the very least, he knows that DC wants the money. That's why he spends over six pages of his proposal trying to convince his editors that his big project will be successful. He doesn't need it to be good, which is great because as we've established, it's not. He just needs it to sell. And honestly, it probably would have. Quality wasn't a requisite for the early comics that Image birthed. The idea of gritty and mature was enough. These aren't your grandpa's comic books about helping oppressed people, no. They were, like, all muscles and guns and killing and morally ambiguous, like Rorschach, even though they were either A, superheroes that killed, which, if you're being honest with yourself, Batman does, or B, serial killers in spandex. And Moore bought into that. Literally. After he left DC, he went to work for Image, writing for art that Rob Liefeld drew. Now, Twilight of the Superheroes would have been better than the first run of Youngblood, sure. Obviously, the art would have been better if they got one of Moore's usual partners, but there still would have been good writing. I don't think foreshadowing or symbolism would have been absent, and we would have had predictably some decent dialogue, even if, as the proposal suggests, the question we'd be getting would just be a palace-swapped Rorschach. Heard joke once. Writer goes to editor. Says he's tired. Says company seems harsh and cruel. Says he feels all alone in a corporate world. Doctor says, treatment is simple. Great artist Alan Moore is in our employ. Go and read his draft. That should pick you up. Man bursts into tears. Says... But editor, I am Alan Moore. Still, we probably would have gotten a really well-written and drawn and colored piece of garbage, and people would have probably loved it. Look at The Dark Knight Strikes again. The name of Miller alone was enough for a lot of people to pretend that it wasn't awful. But that's consumerism. I like this brand. I like this author. This author was good before. They'll be good this time. This author was bad once. They're gonna be bad forever which I bring up to say that this work doesn't invalidate Alan Moore as an artist. Yeah, it's bad and sexist and hateful and inappropriate, but it's a rough draft of an unpublished work. 
He just made this proposal because he thought it'd make money. Chapter 8. Doom Alone. Before I close, I'd like to talk about DC and the allegations that they've used parts of this proposal without Alan Moore's permission. I mean, why would they? Don't they have better ideas? Oh, right. So, a few stories have been accused of plagiarizing the proposal, the most famous being Kingdom Come. Kingdom Come was a 1996 Elseworlds comic by Mark Waid and Alex Ross, and it does share some similarities with Twilight of the Superheroes, what with it being set in a grim, non-nuclear future featuring Superman fighting Captain Marvel, an attack by a new Black Hawk squadron, and Batman sweeping in to try and restore peace. It differs in that the characters that we know and love aren't dictators and fascists. They are generally good people who can be tricked or manipulated into being destructive, which is a better story idea than the idea that all good people are one bad day from becoming the Joker. Though the creators have admitted having knowledge of Twilight of the Superheroes, and wish to have that scope, the story is only superficially similar, and its themes are about as alike as any of Moore's works and their Hollywood adaptations. It's also been argued that Infinite Crisis stole the idea to reinstate the multiverse, but come on, we know that DC was always going to return to a form of the status quo that brings the most money. And then there's Future's End. And you know what, maybe, this is probably a spiritual successor to Twilight of the Superheroes. Traveling back in time to stop horrible future, heroes being unlikable, John Constantine as this annoyingly omnipotent trickster. It's not nearly as bad as Twilight of the Superheroes, which I never thought I would be saying that about Future's End, but it goes for it at some points. There's less fascism, but there's just as much hopelessness and misanthropy. But even if DC does own Twilight of the Superheroes, which they claim to, we'll never see it on the shelves. DC can be awful at times, but even this would be self-sabotage beyond belief. Huh. Do you think that maybe Alan Moore pitched this as a way to sabotage DC after they stabbed him in the back? Well, it doesn't matter. It's, it's, it's still really bad. But, I mean, they milk everything Alan Moore gave them for what they can. Repeated adaptations of For the Man Who Has Everything, the repetitive use of John Constantine, Heck, Watchmen, the perfect example of a closed story, has gotten both pointless prequels and before Watchmen, and a sequel that detracts from the story in Doomsday Clock. They're picking off scraps of work Moore actually published, and at one point cared about. So if I was wrong, and Twilight of the Superheroes was good, we'd currently be receiving a sequel to the event, called like, Nighttime of the Superheroes or something. But we're not because it's so bad even DC won't publish it. Chapter 9, As Ancient Fables Tell So, what was the point of this video? To have fun? Yes, but also to look at how story crafting works. I doubt that I'll reach Alan Moore, and he probably knows most to all of this stuff already, but hopefully I'll reach some other artists. I know that I'm guilty of some of the stuff that creators in the late 80s and early 90s did, particularly copying the superficial aspects of something that I liked while foregoing nuance and pathos. Bad fantasy copies Tolkien's aesthetics and long history, while ignoring his ability to make fantastic settings places for genuinely touching human stories to flourish. Bad sci-fi copies Isaac Asimov's straightforward tone and delivery, while ignoring the wonder with which he viewed science and technology, and the future of mankind. And bad graphic novels even by Alan Moore himself, copy the grim and dark atmosphere and imagery, while ignoring the humanity that could be found even in the darkest places. Like I said, cynicism is easy. But that's not a bad thing. Good works often need a dose of cynicism to feel relatable or exciting. But one of the marks of good art is the ability to span the breadth of human emotion. Pop music is often decried for focusing only on the happy, but gritty graphic novels are what we get when we focus only on the grim. Let's be mindful, as readers and creators, to recognize what made superheroes appealing in the first place, and why we like them. Not because we need escapism, not because we haven't grown up, but because we believe in the possibility of change, the possibility of good, and of course, in the possibility of hope.